Welcome into Palmetto Preps, the podcast. This is your publisher, Chris Clark. Today, we're going to have another Palmetto Preps conversation. Uh, this one is going to be with Spring Valley head football coach Robin Bacon out of Columbia, South Carolina, veteran of the high school coaching ranks, both as an assistant. He played his high school football at Richland Northeast in Columbia and worked his way up. Now the head football coach at Spring Valley and has had a lot of success there. Coach Bacon has a lot of interesting insights um, into the recruiting process, his role as a high school coach in that, um, academics, the importance and the role that high school football can play in young men's lives, uh, how to be a father and balance uh, being a husband and a father as a high school coach, which is hard and demanding. Um, He's got a lot of interesting takes, so hope you enjoy this conversation with Spring Valley head football coach Robin Bacon from palmettopreps.com. so much for joining us here on the uh, palmettopreps.com podcast. I, want to I appreciate, start, appreciate it, Chris. Absolutely. Uh, wanted to start out by sort of getting a little insight into just your mind and how you, how you coach. Um, you know, I've, I've talked with you many times before, whether it's uh, about prospects at your school, about your team there at Spring Valley, and follow you on social media. One thing I noticed is that you seem to be a guy who's well read. You know, you read a lot. You you think a right. lot. You're very involved with your your players. What what sort of led you to become a coach? You know, what what appealed to you about it? Well, it's kind of ironic because I really didn't uh, go to school and you know have a thought of going into coaching. It was um, kind of a freak thing. I was in graduate school at USC. And my high school coach called me up, and they had had a coach uh, kind of back out. And I just finished playing college football. And um, he said, hey, listen, I know you're in graduate school. I know your time's going to be kind of tough, but we actually have a position open here at Rich Northeast High School. Uh, would you be interested in doing that? And, you know, obviously I had a tremendous respect for Dean Fowle, who's my head coach. And I said, yeah, I'll do this. And, you know, I know I could make a little bit of money. And, and it was very little at that time um, to coach, but it was something that, um, you know, I really enjoyed. Um, I saw the impact, you know, that, that my high school coach made on me. Um, he's very much like a father figure to me. and um, uh, you know, when I got out there and, and just being with kids and understanding that, you know, there's a, you know, a bigger purpose, you know, in life and, and what coaches can do as far as being mentors and role models, you know, for players. And, um, you know, I really bonded with a lot of those kids and it, you know, I do some soul searching and praying and saying, Hey, is this what God wants me to do? And, and, uh, you know, after thinking about it, you know, realizing I really love the game, the game gave me a lot, you know, it paid for my college and everything else. I realized that this is something that, you know, I really wanted to help people back in my community. So that's the reason why I got, got into coaching. Tell me a little bit, or maybe for people who don't know your background as much, just sort of your career progression then from there. So, you know, Richland Northeast was your first job as an assistant. How did right. things progress from there to where you ended up at Spring Valley as the head coach? Yeah, I, you know, obviously I went back to my alma mater, Richland Northeast. You know, I stayed there for um, 11 years. Uh, we were very fortunate to have a lot of really good players. You know, we won the state championship in 1993. We were um, always a contender uh, as a, a as a football program. We had tremendous support here at the school. Um, you know, and then there were the opportunities, you know, obviously started presenting themselves uh, for head coaching positions and, and, uh, you know, I really love my alma mater, and I didn't want to leave, but um, my old offensive coordinator uh, at Rich Northeast High School, when I was in high school, Mike Sis took over as athletic director at AC Flora. Um, and, of course, you know, it was a tough decision because we had a lot of talent really coming back, and uh, I felt like we had a shot of winning the state that next year. Um, that was uh, 2000. But, you know, he convinced me that I could, uh, you know, make a difference at AC Flora, and it was a really tough situation, Chris, because they'd won nine games in 11 years, and uh, they weren't very good. Um, there wasn't a lot of support over there. There was a lot of things that needed to be changed, and they were actually, I think, on a, maybe a 37 or 38 or maybe a 40-game losing streak. So it was a situation I knew going in. Um, it was going to be a massive overhaul. And, um, you know, again, I had to pray on and say, say is this what I want to do? Do I really want to leave, you know, something that's really good? But, you know, I wanted the opportunity to be a head coach. It's what I kind of prepared for when I decided I want to make this my profession. And uh, we got over there to AC Flora, and, um, you know, it was tough. You know, there was a lot of uh, 
things that we had to change in the culture. Anytime you have a losing culture and you really uh, want kids to buy in, it, you know, it took us about two years, but we got into the playoffs uh, in the third year and, and we're able to make the playoffs pretty much consistently ever, you know, ever since then. And, um, and then, uh, you know, I, I, my kids were coming up through middle school and they were at Dent Middle School. And uh, I realized I want to get back into District 2. That's where I was. Uh, I looked at opportunities at a couple schools. But uh, Miles Aldridge, we actually ran into each other. And Miles said, uh, hey, would you like to come over here to Spring Valley? I said, absolutely. And, uh, you know, he got me over there as his offensive coordinator. And, of course, he stayed three years and took the head coaching job at Huff High School, where he actually lived, right at, in Charlotte. And then the following year, we had Jerry Brown. And Jerry only lasted for about six months. And then uh, – I was offered the head coaching position at Spring Valley, and so uh, I've been very blessed to be here and be around good people and good coaches. Sure. Now, when you had your first opportunity to be a head coach, I got maybe a couple different parts of this. Yeah. Uh, when you first went to Florida, how did you decide, you know, this is how I'm going to structure my program, whether everything from this is what we have to do, because obviously, like you said, you had a big culture change. You had to implement some things, so – what did you draw upon? You know, what, was it anybody, any coaching influence? You said, I, I want to model after this guy or take some different things. And then how did you decide, okay, this is what we want to be offensively, defensively, special teams from your scheme and your philosophy standpoint? You know, I, I think the biggest thing is you draw back on those guys that made the biggest impact on you. You know, I looked at my dad. My dad was a career West Point infantry officer, and, and he was one of the ones who really got me interested in reading books and telling me, you know, I, I need to read books and – so I looked at a lot of different people's philosophies. I, I went around to a lot of college coaches and spoke to them and said, you know, here's the situation I'm in. Um, you know, obviously I can't go out and recruit. You know, i got to coach what Mama sends me. And it was very thin at AC floor, so Mama didn't send me a lot. So I realized that the first thing I had to do was, you know, what can I do to really kind of change the culture? And, and that's very difficult. You know, if you don't have a culture that's in place and, and there aren't high expectations and, and certain you know, disciplines and things like that. People were allowed to, you know, not make summer workouts and, um, and, and, you know, those kind of things that, you know, I had to kind of really change the culture. I had to change the culture of the coaching staff that was there. And I was very unfortunate because I was brought in so late, I wasn't able to bring in coaches who kind of shared the same philosophy as me. Um, and that was difficult because, you know, I, I told it, you know, I, I don't want to say there's a lot of coaches that are clock watchers and those are guys who, you know, want to practice from four to six and go home. And you, and you really can't do that if you're going to be a high school coach and you want to be successful. you got to put the time in. So I look back at all the coaches that I played for. You know, I, I, I really spoke to them about, you know, their philosophies and what we're going to need to do. And I think the biggest thing, a lot of them told me that, uh, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, I've got to set these – standards of, of what we want to do and expectations, hold kids accountable, get coaches in there that kind of believe like I did. And, and the biggest thing is we wanted to run an offense that we knew would eat up the clock because that was going to help us keep our defense off the field. We didn't have a lot of players that first year. I only had 33 guys on the varsity team, and we played a killer schedule. I mean, we had Camden, who was a had won a state championship. We had Union had won a state championship. They were really in a tough conference. So what we wanted to do was really – uh, run an offense that we knew would take some of the time off the clock and, you know, make the game competitive. And, and then defensively, obviously, um, you know, you base your, your a lot of your schemes on, you know, the talents you have. And, and at that time, we were kind of heavy laden with linebackers. So we were kind of one of the first schools to really run kind of a 3-4. Some people call it a 50, but we went to a kind of a 3-4 defense. We put a lot of athletic guys on the field. So that's kind of, you know, where I – drew a lot of my inspiration from, but also reading books. You know, I, you know, I read Tony Dungy and, you know, a lot of these guys who were, you know, great college and NFL coaches and just kind of read the books that they had put out there and, and kind of developed my mm -hmm. philosophy based on that. How do you feel like you've evolved in the years that you've been a head coach? I mean, you know, schematically, I know you, you have a lot of the same philosophies now at Spring Valley, but obviously, but, you know, how have you evolved just as a, as a coach, whether it is scheme or just something maybe you an area in which you've grown maybe since you first started? You know, I think the biggest thing, we all have to learn. Um, you, you can't stay stagnant. You can't do with the same thing. Things change. You have to change as a coach. You know, I, I think people have – I just watched a great special on ESPN talking about the how the old school coaches have kind of died out. Now there's a new breed and, and the way you have to do it. Um, you know, I'm really big in reading. Uh, I love John Gordon. He's a great, you know, motivational speaker, has a lot of great leadership things. I'm Milt Louder, who um, – uh, is, is a great sports psychologist. I've read a lot of their books and 
realize that, you know, um, and, and I agree with Frank Martin, you know, kids haven't changed. It's really the parents that have changed. And so the biggest thing I've tried to do is try to um, stay ahead of, uh, of the game. I think, you know, I, I created a leadership council. Greg Johnson, who's my freshman coach, he's absolutely outstanding. He uh, worked with Mooney Player, who made millions of dollars after he coached at Lower Rich and go around and talking about leadership. And we established a leadership council at our, our, our football program and tried to develop leadership. Um, I think kids today – um, probably don't have the leadership skills that, that, that kids in the past have had. There's leaders, but there's, you know, we have to develop that a lot more now. I, I think a lot of kids are given stuff and really not have to work for it. Um, and a lot of that's the parents' fault. Uh, a lot of it's the, you know, the, the social media, the, you know, the community, it's the, the place we're in now that, you know, a lot of kids are given stuff versus earning it. And so, um, you know, for me, I wanted to develop, you know, a leadership uh, group and have, you know, really – emphasize to our kids uh, the importance of leadership, you know, and, and not necessarily you have, you have to be a raw, raw guy, but, you know, doing what you're supposed to do in the classroom, which is something that, that I'm very high on. You know, we, we've had a lot of success putting people in college for the simple reason that we've, we develop these kids, you know, to have great work ethic and, and, you know, great classroom thing and understand the importance of what, you know, an education can do. Uh, because I've seen a lot of really good players, Chris, at a lot of schools who are great athletes and, and they were never really pushed in the classroom and, and, you know they're the they're the sad stories of athletics. So th- that was really the big thing for me was developing um, as as time has changed to really develop um, you know leaders in in our school and not just in our school but in our community and and you know hopefully that helps these young men when they're you know 30 and 35 and they're getting married and having children to make all the right decisions in life. I want to go to that just a little bit um, because you you sort of touched on the importance of academics in the recruiting process and one thing I've noticed just covering high school football and recruiting for a while now um you're you're one of the more involved coaches in the recruiting process as far as um for lack of a better term just helping to sort of shepherd your kids you 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 help promote them um there are some coaches who have much more of a hands-off approach why why do you feel like you're more hands-on and then what do you what do you think the role of a high school coach should be during the recruiting process well, I think the biggest thing is that um, I know it can change a generation. If you've got a, a young man who's never had anybody that's uh, in their family go to college, uh, and that young man goes to college and gets a four-year degree, um, you know, economically he's going to be in a better situation. Um, obviously, as I get older, these are the people going to be taking care of me and you. So uh, I understood the importance of, you know, an education and how far it can bring somebody. You know, a lot of people out there don't realize that, you know, a lot of colleges will actually give you more money. If you look at the NAI, the D2s, and the D3 schools, they'll actually give you more money for higher academics um, than they will for you, for athletics. You know, uh, say, for example, Newberry College might give you an $8,000 football scholarship for a $10,000 football scholarship, depending upon what it is. Um, but if you're really strong, you say you have a 3.5 GPA and you have maybe a 1,100 or 1,200 SAT, you're actually going to get more money from the school for academics than you will for athletics. And so that's huge. Um, you know, I understand the impact of what an education does to a young man, especially for somebody who's uh, who's been in a family that's never had the opportunity to get a college education. And obviously that's going to make their kids' lives more important. And, and then, you know, you, you change a generation by getting a kid to go to college. And so for me it's been very important, you know, when I was younger, um, maybe that wasn't as high a priority as winning. And as I got a little bit older and I understood, you know, the importance of, you know, these kids going to school and, and you know, mentoring them. And, um, and it's a village, Chris. You know, I, I've got to have the teachers here at Spring Valley. They have to buy in. You know, our administration has to buy in. Our guidance counselors have to buy in and understand, you know, hey, we're, we're trying to change these kids and give them an opportunity because if I don't, um, when these kids don't finish up and, and, and for whatever reason they waver and get into – you know, a gang or something that happens or, or they, they fall on tough times, you know, um, there may not be something to save that kid. So it's important for me, and I, I felt like as an adult and um, as kind of a, I won't say a leader in our community, but I guess I am a leader in our community, is I want to make sure that we provide these kids with an opportunity to, to be successful. And I know if they get that degree, Chris, it's so important for them, uh, you know, it's going to change a generation and it's going to change their, you know, their kids, their grandkids and everything else. Not, not to have you name any names, or you might not even be comfortable touching this subject, but, you know, you mentioned some kids sort of falling away from athletics, falling away from academics. You know, you as a coach and all your experience doing it, 
can can you think of any examples in which maybe you had a guy or some guys at whatever school it may have been that you know were maybe not on the right path and then athletics football really straightened them out gave them an opportunity to maybe go to college turn them around turn their generation around are, are there multiple examples of that are there any that you can think of yeah there are there are multiple examples and you know a lot and, and I've always tried to you know express that a lot of kids come from different backgrounds you know some mm-hmm. come from two two parent families some come from single parents some come from living with their grandparents and um you know in a lot of those cases sometimes with those grandparents they were held to a higher standard and that's really what got them through school is that maybe their parents didn't do a great job raising them as younger, but the uh, grandparents stepped in or, or it could be an aunt or an uncle, or it could be somebody that was adopted. But yeah, I see it a lot. And it, it is athletics does more to build character. It builds more to deal with resilience. I, I think resilience is the key word I like to use a lot. Um, you know, football's hard. Uh, it's not easy. Um, and, it, you know, do the school work after school, after you're tired, you've had a two and a half hour practice. Um, but it's going to build character things and resilience. And, and those kind of kids who can develop those, you know, uh, high character, academics, commitment, integrity, honesty, um, and resilience, those kids are going to survive. And, and when they get later on in life, I think the lessons that they learn in football, and, and not, not just football, you know, I'd say athletics as, as itself, is going to help those kids get through those tough times. I think if kids have not played a sport, have not been involved with something, uh, during that time period, um, you know, the, the, the culpability of them falling into uh, not being able to get out of a bad situation, whether it be influenced by drugs, influenced by, you know, bad kids in their neighborhood, getting in a car um, that they know may have marijuana or a gun that's there to be able to say, hey, you know what, I, I'm not going with you guys. I, you know, I, I know what I've got to risk. Um, and I think that's important, you know, those kind of things. There's a lot of kids that have survived. And that now, with that being said, there's a lot of kids who haven't made it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, those are the ones as coaches that probably hurt you the most is the kids that, you know, have the talent and some other things. And for whatever reason, maybe the work ethic or, you know, they're not able to say no, they're followers versus being leaders. And that's why, you know, I go back to what I talked about leadership. You know, leadership has got to be able sometimes, you, you know, I tell my kids sometimes you have to tell your best friend, hey, I don't want to be around you because you don't share the same kind of goals, visions that I have, you know, and I want our kids to look at the future. I, I, I don't want a kid to say, hey, Next year, I want to do this. I want them to say, hey, 20 years down the road, this is what I want to do. And I want to give them that idea and say, hey, these are what these are the steps that we've got to go through to get there. So, yeah, there's a lot of kids, Chris, who have made it. Um, I've seen a lot of it at Spring Valley. I've seen a lot of it here you know, at Rich Northeast High School when I was here. I saw it at AC Flora. Um, but I've also seen the, the other side, and that's the ones that really hurts you the most. Yeah, no doubt. A few more questions for you here, Coach. Yeah. Um, you, you have children. Um, right. You, you have children. Uh, obviously, yours. Uh, at least one of them, correct? In college or just finished college? There, there, uh, I've got a I've got a son, RJ, who's a senior, who's a punter and kicker at uh, Presbyterian College, and then my daughter. Um, they're twins. Uh, she's a senior at Clemson. She's uh, majoring in sports psychology and sports communication, and she actually works for um, the football office at Clemson. So she, she works right. with Brant Scott. So. You know, a little bit different dynamic with right at this moment with your kids not being home, but just in general, coaching obviously takes. You know, it, it's a it's a to say it's a full time job is is an understatement. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's something that takes a ton of time. So whether it's now or when your kids were still in high school, how did how did you find that balance between uh, trying to be present at home, uh, you know, spending time with family? How did you work all that out? It's difficult, you know. Um, I'm always going to put my family and my faith before football. I always talk about the three three Fs, you know, faith, family, and football. Um, you know, I've always wanted to put my family first uh, and my faith first. It's tough because of the commitment that's there. Um, you know, a typical day for most high school coaches is, you know, you get to school at 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and um, I normally get home 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. So, you know, there are things that I miss. Uh, obviously as a coach that, you know, I, I wish I'd go back and do it, but, you know, my daughter played club soccer and, and luckily for me, her games were on Saturday. So I'd have a game at Friday. I'd probably get home about one thirty in the morning. I'd get up seven o'clock in the morning. We drive to Aiken for a soccer tournament. I drive to Charlotte or somewhere else. So I always wanted to make sure that I didn't sacrifice. You know, I read the book by Jimmy Johnson, um, and how he basically kind of disowned his family in the, in the pursuit of being coaching. And, and I think you have to, um, 
as a coach, you have to make time for your family. You have to etch that out. I mean, you have to, you know, I tell my coaches at Spring Valley, hey, if your son's playing middle school football, I want you to go to the game. And, uh, you know, they may have to miss practice, but we can move practice or, or miss part of practice. But, you know, they have to move them around. And, you know, I had to do what my son RJ played at Dent Middle School. You know, it was tough for me, but he played on Wednesdays. And, and you know, I was able to kind of work the schedule around where, you know, I was able to go watch some of his games. But, you know, you have to as a parent. I mean, time's going to fly by and you know, you're going to be in a situation where, you know, you've got to fall back on what you do. And, of course, I go every Saturday. I'm either at uh, Presbyterian College for games or I'm going out there to visit Lene at Clemson and um, just trying to, you know, find time for them because the one thing I don't want them to have was an absent father. I want to make sure that they understood I loved them. I was going to be there for them. You know, I never missed anything that, that was important. Um, whether it be games or something else that was there. Um, I'd miss practices and things like that, but I made sure I was there for them. Coach, last thing for you. Uh, you've obviously been able to accomplish some, some cool things as a coach, whether an assistant, a head coach, had an impact on people. Are there any goals that, you know, it could be this year, it could be, you know, five years down the road or just by the time you finish coaching, any goals that you'd like to accomplish, you know, that maybe you haven't or something you'd like to do again? Just in general, you know, when you look at the long view. Yeah, I'd like to get back to a state championship game. You know, we've got a good group of kids at Spring Valley. I think we've got a community that's kind of supporting us. Um, I'd love to coach. I've had, you know, several kids play in the U.S. Army game. I've had several kids play in the Under Armour All-American game. And I'd love to have an opportunity to coach at one of those games. Uh, you know, I'm at the point now where I'd love to get into college football. I mean, that's something, um, you know, I really feel like I could help a college program, whether it be in the recruiting aspect. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the field. Um, I think I could be a great asset for them just from my experience in high school and, and knowing what coaches, you know, obviously go through, how the recruiting process works. I feel like we've done a really good job at Spring Valley. Um, you know, we put over 50 kids in school over the last four years, and I think probably if you put us against anybody in the state, we're probably one of the top, you know, if not the top program putting kids into school. So I understand the process, and I really think I could help colleges with their recruiting and getting kids and getting them to understand the the, the, the layout of, of, you know, high school sports. But, um, but you know, I also want to be a great father and I want to be a great husband. And that's that's always been my great goal that, you know, I do that. I hope that my kids understand that. I hope my wife know that, you know, I've had to make a lot of sacrifices sometimes away from the family as as a coach. But I think the biggest thing is, you know, for me, just continue to be a great dad. Hopefully I'll be a grandfather sometime and be good at that. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, just continue to be a good husband for my wife because she's really sacrificed a lot for me to be in the position I'm at. And I, you know, I love Marsha to death and couldn't, couldn't have a better wife who's supportive of, of, of my dreams and my goals. All right, Coach. Well, hey, I really appreciate your time. It's Coach Robin Bacon from Spring Valley High School. Best of luck uh, to the Vikings this season. Hope uh, everything goes Chris. well. Thanks I so appreciate much for joining us. I appreciate, Chris, all you do. Thank you very much.